California and she is really helping me make sure I get everything going with this event. So the event's going to be recorded and I wanna use that as a disclaimer because we are gonna have an open forum section at the end of this event where everyone can put their questions in the chat box and then we'll be moderating it to our two panelists. Uh, so if there's something that is a little bit too personal that you'd rather just direct message our panelists, go ahead and do that. But if you want something a little bit more broad or you feel like everyone should have that knowledge and you wanna ask the panelists, go ahead and ask that. But the event will be recorded and posted to a YouTube channel, uh, the Meme and Thor YouTube channel specifically. So I just wanna be very mindful of that. And okay, thank you everyone again for taking the time to be here today. Uh, my name is Vanessa Alvarado. I am a VP of mentorship here in Mimentor for the SoCal region. And I've been involved with the organization for about three years now. So I'm dating myself, but <laughs> uh, my junior year of undergrad is when I got involved. And honestly, I really lacked the mentorship. And I really lacked the directionality being first generation and coming from a low income household that uh, the organization really helped me bolster my professional resume and also find like fine tune the directionality I wanted to take my career. So I am pre-med as well. However, I am in my gap year. So if you have any questions about taking gap years or if you're like not sure if you wanna even go about that route, but you kind of feel like you need to, just feel free to reach out. You know, everyone has their own individual journey and that's kind of the beauty of the organization is that there's so many individuals who are super successful in their journey. However, they might not have had the most traditional path. So you can always reach out and representation matters. So that's what the organization is here for. Now, welcome to this event. This is part of the MCAT 101 series. And I'll get a little bit more into what the series is gonna be about in the next slide, but this is our first episode. So yay, thank you guys for all joining. You guys are all spearheading a new initiative. And uh, this first episode is gonna be the introduction to the exam and uh, resources, how to gather them, how to use them in the most effective manner. And our two fantastic speakers are going to be Matthew Rios and Fernando Postigo, and you'll meet them soon, but they're very, very brilliant people, and they're very humble, and they're very organized with everything that they do, so I'm very grateful for their participation here. And again, Joanna Gonzalez, she's been so amazing, and she's helped organize this all together, so thank you to everybody who's participated. So to get a little bit more oriented with what this series is. This is just a general kind of infographic that I created, but it's basically just an initiative that was conjured when I did a couple of events the past fall semester. So our semesters here at Mimen are divided into fall and spring semester based on our events. And I got a lot of feedback that some individuals said, well, can we have like a basics introductory type of uh, series to kind of tackle the MCAT? Cause the MCAT is a beast and well, here it is. So stay tuned for any upcoming episodes. Um, the frequency of the episodes is yet to be determined uh, just because it's been a little bit like kind of last minute, but um, please, this is an interactive series. This is really just to help anyone who will be uh, needing it and who might find it useful. It's not at all something that we're just tailoring for ourselves. It's something that whatever you guys feel you need, please give us that feedback so we can then create it and make sure that you guys get what you want out of the organization. Um, and moving on. So a little bit of background. So me and Thor, I don't know how many of you are all active members of the organization, but welcome if you are. And if you aren't also welcome. Everyone's welcome, but if you aren't, uh, I'll give you a little bit of background as to what we do here. So we're really just an organization that was created in 2012 by a group of medical students at UCLA that found the need to bridge the gap between people who come from underserved communities that wanted to go into the pre-health industry and didn't really have the mentorship to do so. So in order to do that, they created a nonprofit organization now known as Mi Mentor that boomed really over the span of what, almost nine years. So they went from having maybe about 20 members to now over 12,000. So we're growing and scaling at a pretty large rate, which is also why I encourage anyone who's from outside of California, or even now we have a really nice and robust uh, network in Georgia, but anyone outside of those or like both those regions, please, please, please let us know if you'd like to get involved and if you'd like to start a chapter there. Um, because we do understand that there's so many people that have joined the organization, but they're not localized in California. So we wanna make sure that our networking and our programming is very inclusive. 
Um, and yeah, we just really try to support everybody with creating together. We mentor events such as this one together. We lead events, which are kind of longer conferences that cover an array of topics. Uh, a lot of other sort of opportunities such as MSR, which is the medical school readiness program. I'll get a little bit more into that later on. Um, but that's a really, really helpful program that Meme and created that really is designed to package you as the medical student that you need to be, or the medical student, medical school applicant, I'm sorry, that you want to be. You know, it's kind of like a training prep course and everything is free of cost because this is a nonprofit organization. It's really just based on the mission to help others um, get to the next level. Kind of like a pay it forward sort of situation because a lot of the mentors that we have here are established healthcare professionals and we're once in the pre-health shoes. So please do not be shy if you feel like you want to reach out to anyone on our network. Uh, the website itself is kind of like a social network. We do have rules. We do have guidance, guidelines that we have to adhere to. But it is definitely a social network where you can reach out to any sort of mentorship potential or potential mentor that you find or anyone that you see like has similar interests to you. And if you even want to start a study group, you know, everyone's grouped around by the same area. So you can go ahead and do that, too. Um, and I'm going to move a little bit forward. So. And the thing about me, Menthod, is that we already have so much gold golden resources already posted on the website so i've listed a few this is by no means an exhaustive list but it's definitely some that i found useful in my mcat studying as well so our first um resource that i conjured up is going to be this article and i have it linked here by the way everyone will get a copy of the slides after you fill out the post event survey so i'll be sending those out uh, this was created by ronald castillo who is now a medical student i believe at usc or UCI, I'm so sorry uh, if I got that wrong. Uh, but he lists a pretty good number of free resources for Gen Chem, O Chem, Psych, Soch, and Physics, not CARS, but CARS, usually Jack Weston is a pretty good option. Um, then we also have the Study Efficiently article. So this was a very inspirational piece that I found helpful, made by Jamie Fernandez, who is an MS4 that just matched into, I believe, UC San Francisco. So. She knows what she's talking about, right? <laughs> and she basically just went about and said how to strategize your studying to maximize what your strengths are and work on your weaknesses to then kind of make sure you're actually studying efficiently. And I also have it linked here. We also have different a number of different groups. So if you identify with any of the groups found on me, Method, feel free to join. They're kind of like an open forum Reddit style where you can ask any sort of questions, obviously adhering to the guidelines and all that stuff. But there's an MCAT studying support group where you can pitch any question like, how did you guys like exam crackers? How did you like this resource? Did you find it more helpful to work full time or work part time? You know, stuff like that. And then I'll move forward. OK, another page. So I try to make this as sweet and simple as possible for the sake of time. Uh, but we also have, like I mentioned previously, the MSR program. So that's called the Medical School Ready Program. This is a program that you have to apply to. And there's a there's kind of like a finite amount of spaces. However, now that we've kind of moved a lot of our mentorship uh, opportunities virtual due to the pandemic, uh, there's a lot more space and there's a lot more availability to actually join because previously it was localized to California and based on regions, but now it's nationwide, global really, <laughs> but nationwide because AMCAS is really applicable to the United States. So uh, that is a phenomenal program. I was lucky enough to be part of it. I was part of it with Matthew. And uh, it was just a very, very thorough and exhaustive program that kind of walked you through the entire application, starting from taking the MCAT uh, to developing your personal statement, getting your 15 activities down to a T, making sure you get your letters of re or reference and how to interview. It's a very, very amazing program. And the application starts around uh, I think I applied in July, and I think this past year it also opened up in July. So it's around the late summer. Stay tuned for that. The updates will be live on memento.com or .org, I'm sorry. Uh, and I really highly recommend if you're looking to apply within the next year, maybe for 2023, I believe it's going to be. So applying next year to start 2023, uh, I highly recommend you apply this summer. And then... Last but not least, 
we have our own YouTube channel with, to which this video or this webinar will be posted to. And we already have a couple of uh, MCAT studying skills webinars, but there is a lot of different resources there, such as um, how to network at a conference, uh, different Together We Lead events that we've had in the past, such as social justice initiatives and like uh, the osteopathic route to medicine. Those are all uploaded to the YouTube channel. So feel free to check it out when you get a chance. There's plenty of resources there. So without further ado, I'm going to pass this over to Matthew, who's going to be our first presenter. I'll let him share his screen. Thank you, Matthew. Can everyone see the screen? Okay. Yes. Um, just going to minimize it a little bit. OK. So hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Matthew Rios. And I'll be um, presenting just a little bit of background on just like the MCAT itself, just so we can be like ground level, like everyone understands what the MCAT is, as well as um, both me and Fernando are going to go through um, kind of just some of the resources that we use um, so that, that that can hopefully be helpful. And one thing I want to reiterate is uh, Meme and Thoad's a really, really great like tool. Um, I'm not like a part of the board or anything. Um, I really believe in it. Like it really helped me. Like Vanessa said, I was part of MSR, and I think that that was one of the really key factors in helping me be really prepared for the application cycle. So I I applied during the COVID cycle, um, and I will be a medical student next year. So that's really exciting. Um, well, I guess this this fall. But um, here's just some information about me. My name is Matthew Rios. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, his. I'm a Mexican-American. I'm, I'm um, a first-generation college graduate. Um, I graduated from UCLA in 2020 with a major in neuroscience and a minor in global health. Um, actually, I was a transfer student. So I actually transferred from Johns Hopkins um, so I did two years at Johns Hopkins and then transferred to UCLA. So um, to all my East Coasters there, um, like it'd be, it'd be really great to see like something happen in the East Coast because I feel like this is something that's needed on the East Coast as well. I took my MCAT uh, September of 2019 and got a 517 with my score breakdown being there. Um, I'm going to be attending medical school this fall. Um, and my, my like big goal is to become a physician educator. So I wanna work clinically with underserved communities, but I also wanna create pipeline programs to increase diversity in medicine. And a big reason for why I wanna do that work is because um, I've gone through a lot of pipeline programs that really helped me um, get to where I am and I, I wouldn't be successful without um, their help. So, this is just an overview of what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about what is the MCAT and how to register for the MCAT and when. Um, I think that the second part is is just as important about like than the first part because even like registering can be really difficult and really like stressful. So I want to make sure that you have all the information you need to even like su successfully register for the MCAT and know when you should take it as well. So. The first, uh, the first part is what is the MCAT? So the MCAT is just an acronym for the Medical College Admissions Test. It's developed and administered by the AMC, which is the American Academy of Medical Colleges. And it's a standardized multiple choice exam created to help medical school admissions offices um, assess your problem solving, your critical thinking, and knowledge of natural behavioral and social science concepts that are prerequisites to um, studying medicine. So this is just the, the definition of it from the AMC. So the people who make the test themselves. Um, in terms of what is covered on the test, the, the MCAT is composed of four different sections. So there's the chemical and physical foundations of biological sy systems, which I call the chem -phys section. So basically chemistry and physics, uh, the critical analysis and reasoning skills, which everyone calls the car section for short. Um, and this is like really just like reading skills. Um, there's the biological and biochemical foundations of biological systems, which I call the bio biochem section, and then the psychological, social, and biological foundations of behavior. So that's the, the psychology and sociology section. 
Um, I also have links throughout the presentation, so hopefully that'll be helpful. But there's um, there are like exact foundations that um, the MCAT is supposed to test, and so um, you can look uh, for those foundations with those links, and that should um, be able to help you if you want to know exactly like what in chemistry do they really want you to know. So what are the sections composed of? So for the chem phys, bio, biochem, and psych -soch, they're very similar. They have uh, 59 questions with 10 passages. And of those 59 questions, 15 are discrete, meaning that they don't pertain to a passage. So an example of a discrete question, which would be which of the following will cause a blood pH of 8.2, and then there's answer choices. Uh, versus like a, a passage-based question is you're given like a passage, like an experiment, and then you have to answer questions based on that passage. So 44 of the 59 questions are passage-based. So there's a lot of passage-based questions, um, which means that it's, it's really important not only to um, understand your content, I feel like discrete questions are really good way to show that you know your content, but also how to apply that content critically with the passage-based questions. Um, and you have 95 minutes for each of those sections. And then there's the car sections. So those are 53 questions with nine passages. It's all reading in like humanities. So it could be like you have a passage on like theater or philosophy, um, and they, they're basically just reading comprehension questions. And you're giving 90 minutes for this section and um, none of them, you don't have any discrete questions because they're all about like reading comprehension about like the tone of the, the, the passage and all those good things. Also, if you have any questions like throughout the, the presentation, feel free to like put it in the chat. Okay. So when to take the MCAT is, this really depends on like when you want to apply. So let's just uh, assume that you're going to apply straight out of med or straight out of undergraduate to medical school. So you would want to, um, you would want to take the, the uh, test um, probably somewhere between the end of your sophomore year and the April of your junior year. Um, the, the rule, the rule which um, isn't like a hard and fast rule, is you want to take the exam by the April of the year you want to apply. Um, then for every gap year that you want to take, just add an extra year to that, like, to that April. So let's say, for example, me, I applied um, the end of my senior year. So I would have had to take in the um, MCAT exam by April of my senior year. I took it the summer. Before, um, before I graduated, but um, like that's just an example. The other thing that I think is really important is to plan to take most, if not all the relevant courses before taking the MCAT. So for chem, the chem physics section, that means gen chem, physics, organic chemistry, and biochemistry for cars, um, I would recommend taking a humanities course with lots of reading could be like a theater, art, ethics, philosophy. And I think that's really good because, and, and do the reading in those courses is another thing as well, because you're going to have to um, learn how to read those subjects. And, and I think being comfortable with reading things that you might not be interested in is really important as well in CARS. Um, another thing for bio, biochem, biology, biochemistry, statistics is really important, not necessarily knowing how um, to do all like the statistical analysis, but knowing how to interpret gap graphs, um, knowing how to interpret data, knowing what significance means is really, really important in the bio biochem section and the psych -social section. I would also recommend either like doing, like being part of research could be good, um, as well as either doing like a research methods course or just being in a course with lots of journal readings because that's a lot of what like the bio biochem kind of takes um, like passages from, from like actual studies. And then for psych -soc psychology, sociology, and then biology specifically, like neuroscience is really important um, as well as statistics. I see that there are some questions. So I am just going to check to see if there's any. I have a question about the chem section. Is it uh, three different sections in that section? No, it's just one section. It just covers 
all of these topics. Um, so all the, the, the four sections are, are chem, phys, cars, bio, biochem, psych, soch, but they kind of cover um, some, some, some of them like overlap, like biochemistry can sometimes be in the chem, phys section, but um, chem, phys is really more like gen chem, physics, organic chemistry. Um, bio biochem is obviously mostly biology and biochemistry, and then psych soch is mostly like psychology, sociology, and biology. These are just the like topics that are like in those sections. I hope that clears it up. Was there any other questions I missed? Okay, I'm gonna move on then. So this is just how the MCAT is scored. In case um, you have no idea, it's it's very weirdly scored. Um, I don't understand why they did it this way, but um, I guess that's okay. Um, but basically, it's scored from 118 being the lowest and 132 being the highest on, on every section. And your score um, is basically the, the sum of all your sections. So what you want to do is get as far away to the right from 500 as you can. So 500 here is the 50th percentile. So that's average, and you want to get as close to 528 as possible. Um, and so it, I think something that's really important is um, looking at your scores in each section and understanding like where your lowest section is, where those extra points can come in to move you more to the right. Um, not necessarily like, like, for example, if you're really good at psych social and you're already scoring 132, you may not want to keep like only study psych social. Like you'd want to make sure that you're you're studying your weaker parts. Um, the next slide is not to scare you. Um, it can be very scary, but um, this is just showing you like the GPA and the MCAT scores of people who were accepted to at least one medical school. Um, I think something that is both a little bit scary, but also kind of kind of good is even those people with high GPAs and high MCAT scores, like the, the, it, this isn't 100%, this is 88%. I think it just goes to show you that the medical school application process is very holistic. Um, I think the other thing that this kind of says is that GPA and MCAT are important, but they aren't the end all be all. So um, take definitely like take, take these exams and, and your undergraduate very seriously. Um, but also know that that's not the only thing that will get you accepted into med school because there's these people with high GPAs and high MCAT scores that still didn't get in. Um, so now I'm gonna be covering how and when to register. Hopefully I answered most of your questions about like the basics of the MCAT. So how to register for the MCAT and when. So um, just in case you were wondering, I, during COVID last year, the MCAT was shortened, but the MCAT is back to its full length. Um, for this year, registration um, opened in November for January and March dates, February for April and June dates, and then April for July to September dates. Um, that doesn't mean that those um, those will be like the same time uh, registration opens for next year. So um, if you are thinking of taking the exam next year, I would just like uh, follow the AMC or yeah the AMC on the on Twitter because they they kind of post like their their updates for like test dates on there. And in terms of like registration and all that stuff, um, it's really interesting. I don't know why they do that, but um, just some tips for registration. Dates do tend to get filled pretty quickly, so it's really best to register as early as you can. Um, scores are usually given a month after the test date. That's why I recommend that the latest you take it is April before you apply, and that's so that you can know your test score before you um, apply to medical school and so that you're not applying like blindly not knowing um, what you got in your MCAT. And then if your scheduled date is full, you can ask to receive an email when someone drops it. Um, you do have to choose like a specific location. 
Um, so that's just something to keep in mind. Um, when I was taking the MCAT, there was just one time that you could take it, um, but now they've changed it. So there's two times um, in one day where the MCAT is administered because of COVID. Um, so it can be administered at 7.30 or at 3 p.m. And to register, you have to make an AMC account and register by going to the Applying to Medical School tab. And if you wanna see the 2021 scheduling for exams, it's here, it's also on the next slide. Um, one thing to keep in mind is if you ever done like a like a AMC um, like summer program, like summer health professions education program, that same account that you use to apply for SHPEP will be the same account that you are going to use for AMC and then also for eventually applying to medical school. So these are the test dates for um, 2021. And just like a heads up, like you can see there's no test dates in February and there's no test dates um, in October, November, December. So just keep that in mind when you're thinking about studying for the MCAT because um, those test dates don't exist. Um, but these are the ones for this year and it may change next year. Um, we'll see what happens. Um, and you can see the score release dates here as well. And you can see they're a little bit over a month for each of the each of the the scores um, so like this is September 2nd and it got uh, transmitted October 5th so in terms of registration costs currently right now there's no no cost for canceling or rescheduling just because of COVID um, I, I'm almost 100% sure that they're like once things get kind of back to normal they won't have that anymore and they will reinstate fees. I hope they I hope they don't because I, I think that's a little bit inequitable, but um, the initial registration for the MCAT is $320. And then um, right now, um, the, the, the nice thing is that if you cancel, you can get a, a full refund. Um, but again, I don't know if that's going to stay forever. Um, and then the other thing is that there's this program called the fee assistance program. And basically what that does is it gives you a discount on the MCAT as well as a lot of other things. And I'll talk a little bit more about it on the next slide, but you can see that it's 130 instead of um, 350 or, or however it was, how, however much it was. So in terms of the fee assistance program, um, there's uh, in terms of eligibility, you can apply up to five times. And it takes around 10 days to process the application. Um, there's citizenship requirements. You either need to be a citizen of the US, a US national, a lawful permanent residence, refugee or asylee status, um, or um, have DACA status from the US government. In terms of income, um, you would qualify if your total family income is 400% or less than the national poverty level for a family of your size. And you can see to the right, here, um, what that would look like. I, I think it's different for Hawaii and Alaska, um, just because they're they're not within like the continental US. And so they have, I think, a higher. Um, and then the benefits, which expire at the end of the next calendar year, is that you get registered MCAT registration. You get all the MCAT prep by the AMC. Um, you get the MSAR, which is basically gives you data on medical schools that include like GPA, MCAT scores, even like how they interview, um, all that good stuff that, that's important to, to making a medical school list. And then you also get a waiver for the MCAT. So you don't, um, to apply to medical school, you have to pay uh, money for the MCAT. I think it's like 170 or something like that, plus like $41 for every school. So you get a waiver for up to 20 medical school applications, which is a lot of money. Um, I see that there is a comment. Is there a deadline for the fee assistance program? I do not believe there's a deadline, um, but one thing to just keep in mind is that the benefits expire at the end of the next calendar year. So if you like applied like December, you're not using it to the fullest potential because those uh, benefits are going to expire next year, like the end of December. 
um, versus someone who like registered for it, like maybe in January, um, they would get like the most use out of it. So that's just something to keep in mind. Um, another thing that um, might be interesting um, is the MedMar. So it's just the Medical Minority Applicant Registry. So it just basically serves as identifying someone who um, is might, might consider themselves underrepresented in medicine or economically disadvantaged. You're only asked when registering for the MCAT and sometimes it can provide you with opportunities such as secondary waivers or, or schools may contact you as a result of being on the MedMar. Um, I don't think it's a like, like super duper helpful thing, but I think it's it's something to to um, just put your name or or check that box just in case there there is something good that can come out of it for you. Let me just double it. Okay. Okay. So that's all about like the, the basics on the MCAT. Hopefully that was really helpful, and hopefully that helped like level set to make sure that we're all on the same page. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about um, what I did in terms of studying the resources that I use. Um, so yeah. So this is how I studied for the MCAT. I studied during the summer of my junior year. And the reason I did that was that was the exact, um, that was when I was finished with all my prereq courses. So my uh, gen chem, my biochem, my uh, organic chemistry, my physics, bio, um, all those psych soch, all those prereq courses were done before I started studying. And the reason why I, I did it so soon after I finished all the courses was because I kind of wanted like that, that foundation that I had already from those courses and, and just build on that instead of having to um, like relearn things um, by, by waiting like another year or two after I've taken all those courses. Um, so I studied during the summer. I worked um, part time for like a couple weeks, and then I studied for full time for most of it. Um, so I did four weeks of studying for content review, and that was also when I was kind of working part time. And then I did seven weeks of studying um, full time. So um, in terms of content review, the resources that I used were the Princeton books. I really think any any um, MCAT books are fine. Um, Khan Academy, Jack Weston for cars, and then Anki. And Anki, I can, if anyone has, well, I'll, I'll explain a little bit more about what, what each of these things are. For practice problems, I use Khan Academy again. Uh, next Steps, um, I, I found this book that just had a bunch of practice problems. And then again, I use Jack Weston. Um, and then for practice test, I used um, Princeton because they just came with my books. So it didn't make sense not to use those practice tests. So three, three tests came with my books. I bought six more tests from Next Steps, which is now Blueprint. And then I took another three tests using um, the AMC. I believe now the AMC has four tests. And then I used Google Sheets to track my progress. Uh, study only, would you recommend studying uh, right after taking? I, I would personally, um, I had the ability to uh, study full time. Um, in, uh, so I would, yes, I did study for only 11 weeks, but I studied full time. And I think that's what made a difference. People who study like part time because they have classes or other responsibilities usually take a longer time. Um, and I would recommend studying for the MCAT after, not necessarily like studying right after taking the appropriate classes. I, I started studying right after I, I finished my last like quarter with, with all the classes. So uh, after spring quarter, um, I started studying that summer. But that was that was what worked for me. Um, about how many? So I'll I'll get to that question when I talk a little bit about my tests. Um, so how I use my resources. So I have the Princeton books, and I would read or 
I would go through one chapter of three to four different books each day. And I would make summaries of each chapter on a Google document. Um, I think something that's really important to highlight is that I did one chapter of three to four different books. I didn't just stick to like biology for like the whole day or even for the whole week or for the whole month. Like you should be doing, um, you should be studying all these subjects kind of concurrently. And the reason why I think that's a better strategy is because the test is going to test you on all those subjects concurrently in one day. And so being able to switch from like one, um, one type of thing um, to another type, I think is really, really important. Another thing that I did, which just like helped me mentally was I, I paired uh, stuff that I really didn't like with, um, so books that I didn't really like, like I really hated like biology, specifically like genetics. Um, so I, I would pair those chapters with things that I really liked. So I really like psychology and sociology, like that was my bread and butter. So I would pair those books together. Um, and I made summaries of, of those chapters on a Google document and I kept those Google documents. And once, once I went through the whole books, I, I never like looked at my books ever again. I only looked at my like Google document and I printed them out. And those are my notes that I would um, highlight, mark, um, change, edit um, after I went through all those books. Um, I also use Khan Academy more as a secondary source if I was ever stuck on a hard topic. So like for me, like I couldn't understand lenses for the life of me. Um, so I went to Khan Academy and used um, it as a secondary source. Um, and I made sure not to get like really too caught up in like content review and like knowing every single detail which I, I don't think for, for the MCAT, it's necessary to know every single detail that the Princeton books are really, really dense too. Um, so I didn't, I, I mostly focused on like the big ideas and I think that that was very helpful. Um, the other resource I used was Jack Weston. So Jack Weston, um, they have this uh, website where you can do practice problems specifically for cars. And he has thousands of thousands of cars passages. He, he literally does one like every single day. Um, and so you can, you can do the, the practice problems. And, and what's really great about it is it kind of uses the MCAT interface, which I think is very um, in my like overview, the MCAT is a computer exam. Like you're, you're going to be on the computer. Um, one thing though, is that you're not gonna have like features like control find. So don't, don't use those if you're ever doing like a practice test or something. So for Jack Weston, I did one to two cars questions at the end of, of my studying every single day during content review. Um, and I think that was just important because it helped me get used to the kinds of questions that they would ask and it, I was reading every single day, um, specifically like humanity stuff, um, which I think is really important for cars. Um, the other thing I did was Anki. I, I don't know if you've ever heard of Anki, but Anki is basically um, just a like flashcard program. And what they do is they specifically have spaced repetition, which basically means that um, when you flip over a card, let's say, like digitally, because it's like an app. Um, it'll ask you whether you felt really good about it or if you feel like you didn't remember it at all. And based on that, it would either show you it more if you felt really like bad about it or if you felt really good about it, then it would show you the card less. Um, and I, I just used, um, there, there's some decks that are already made and I just used um, one of those decks um, I didn't really have any like set goals for how many Anki cards to do. And I didn't have the, I, I should have like organized my cards better because they were just all in one pile instead of being like um, separated by section. And so I, 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 I still found that was useful, but I don't think I used it to the fullest potential. Let me look at some of the, did I take a diagnostic 
um, exam before I started studying. Yes, I took a full length. I didn't take a diagnostic. I took a full length. And I think that that was actually a good thing to do because you kind of understand what you're getting yourself into. Um, so I, I think it's good. If you don't mind me asking, were you able to get through all the Princeton books or were there some sections you found helpful of the over others. Personally, I have a hard time reading this like Soch Kaplan books. Um, I did get through all the Princeton books. Um, there were, the, the good thing about Princeton is that some of the, the chapters repeated itself. So I, I would skip those repeated chapters. Like there were some bio, bio chapters in like the psych Soch section because there's like neuroscience. Um, yeah, it can be hard. I would recommend for psych Soch specifically um, there is this 300 page Khan Academy book or Khan Academy like PDF that's a lot better I've heard in terms of like content. Um, so I can send you the link. I think the link to that is actually in this PowerPoint. So you can look through that and that should be helpful. At one point, did you see, okay. Um, I'll talk about that a little bit later, Amy. Um, so the other resource that I used was practice problems. So this was after I did my four weeks of content review. Basically, every single day I would be doing either practice problems or taking a practice test or, um, or reviewing my practice test. So in terms of doing practice problems, this was, again, after finishing my content review, I did four to five passages of each section in the MCAT order. So I would do um, four to five passages of chem phys, then I would do four to five passages of cars, then I would do four to five passages of bio biochem, then four to five passages of psych -soch. Um, The reason I did it in this order, because this is the exact order that the MCAT tests you in. And so I think it was very helpful because I started to like learn how to shift my, my brain from going like from chem phys to cars to bio biochem to psych -soch. And I think that's really, really important in just like the, the test itself. Um, I would review like the, so I would do chem phys, do the problems, then review, review the passages um, and review the questions I got wrong. Then I would go to cars, do the questions, review the ones I got wrong, then bio biochem and you get it. Um, I mostly use Khan Academy, which um, has free practice problems. Sadly, they're going to be discontinued in September of 2021, which I think is just very sad because it's it's a very like accessible like source. Um, I thought they were good, but um, the, the only bad thing I saw about it is that they didn't use the MCAT interface. And then you kind of, you had to answer a question before you I could move on to the next question, which isn't like realistic in terms of like what you're actually going to do for the MCAT. And then the other thing I used was I found um, the library is a really, really good resource, not just for like studying and like being there, but they also have lots of like MCAT books. I found this uh, Next Steps practice problem books, which just um, basically for every section, it just had a whole bunch of like practice questions for each section. And so I would go through um, like the chem phys, then I would go through the cars, then I would go through like basically the same thing I did. And I, I rented it from the library and it was a really, really helpful resource and it was free. So I, 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 didn't, I didn't use UWorld, but I've heard really great things about UWorld in terms of practice problems. So I would recommend like UWorld, but I didn't personally use it. I used Next Steps practice problem book. Um, the other thing I used was Jack Weston because they had cars problems with the MCAT interface. Okay, so I'm gonna go to the my last part, which is about practice tests. Um, so something um, that's really important is taking practice tests. I took around 12 practice tests, which seems like a lot. And in the grand scheme of things, it, it was a lot, but I think it really helped me um, build my stamina for the actual exam. And it really helped me um, see mistakes that I made because of the way the exam is made. Um, so something in terms of practice tests is make sure that you're mimicking testing conditions, like don't use control F on your laptop because you're not going to be able to do that on the actual test. Um, that, that's what I did for 
a couple of my practice tests and I realized like I'm not going to have that during my actual test. Um, and the other thing is like take the, the exam in one sitting like because you're going to have to do that during the actual exam and also make sure that you have a quiet place. So if you um, have to like stay at home because of COVID, like make sure that you're, you're setting boundaries with either your roommates or the, the people that you're living with um, to let them know like, hey, I'm, I'm taking this like seven hour long exam, like please be quiet a little bit. Um, and yeah, so I use the Princeton practice tests. Um, they were very deflated, but it was a good way to like see where I needed to uh, focus my attention on. Um, I use Blueprint. Oh, also, I remember during my like, so I think I, I scored like a 504 on my second test. And then on my third test, I got a 500 and I was like really demoralized. Um, but I was really lucky because I had like a mentor who um, like really helped me out and like made, made me like keep going. Um, so like you're going to have, you're going to have times during your MCAT studying where you feel like drained or you feel like you don't want to do this and that's normal but uh, make sure that you have like the support system in place to, to keep you going um i use the I, I after doing the princeton practice test i did the blueprint practice test and and just um heads up in terms of how many tests like a week i did i know that was a question i did around like one to two tests per week so um like every three to four days i would take a practice test um and then what I would do was I would take the practice test and then I would, for the rest of the day, just rest. And then the next day I would review my practice test. Um, so just in case anyone was wondering about that. I, so I used the Blueprint practice test. I just heard that they were a really good uh, resource and that they were uh, more accurate. Um, so I did, like they were more accurate to my re real score compared to like Princeton, but they were still a little deflated. Um, and I also remember like plateauing during while I was taking some of these tests. And I think what's really important is to understand why you, you're getting stuff wrong or understanding like why you're struggling. Um, I remember doing my practice tests and I, I remember like I would do really well in my like psych social sections, but I wasn't doing as well as I knew I could have been doing. And I, I remember um, in my practice tests, because psychosocial was like my best section, I would like kind of be burnt out and by the end of it, because psychosocial is all the way at the end, and I would like kind of rush through it. Um, and that I realized I was doing that. So what I made myself do was like double check every single question after like realizing that. And that really helped my score increase as well as um, I remember struggling with all like the research-based passages. And so what I did was I just like went on Google and looked up like MCAT research-based passages help. And I think that I, I found this video that kind of explained like a, a really good tactic for how to do research-based passages. And I think that, that was also really, really helpful. And that helped me like increase my score. And then lastly, there's the AMC practice tests. Um, you should take these towards the end of your setting. They're representative of your actual score. I got a 512, a 518, and a 519. And if you like average them, they're around 517. Um, and then one thing I just wanna emphasize is don't take the exam if you know you're not hitting your score goals. Um, like don't, don't expect like, like on your practice test, you're getting below 500, don't expect to um, like go over 500 if you're not hitting those on your practice test. I, uh, I would say to always like reassess, uh, talk to a mentor and figure out what your plan of action will be instead of, um, instead of just like taking it because um, a bad score can kind of like just bring you down a little bit. Um, so let's see, what point, okay. Do you review only once or more after taking a full length? I just reviewed it, re reviewed my full length once. And these were, I had really simple spreadsheets. I know people do like a little bit more and like, 
but yeah, mine were very simple. So this was just like tracking my score um, and my improvement and like my sections. Um, so this is just so I could like see where I was at in terms of my score. And you could see like the, the AMC scores were closer to, to where I actually hit. Um, and then this was, I had a spreadsheet for every section where I would put the passage and the question number, the date, the type of passage, why did I get this wrong and what I can do better. Um, this, this was a very simple spreadsheet, but I think it was very effective because it made me think critically about like why I got something wrong, not necessarily telling me like I got this wrong because of content, because not that's not necessarily true for all the problems. Um, so one, one thing was like buoyancy, why did I get this wrong? I forgot the maximum point force is PVG. What can I do better? Memorize the formulas for point force. So it was a really simple, I did this only for the questions that I got wrong. I, uh, if I were to go back, I would probably do the questions I got wrong and the questions I flagged. Though I know people who did, did it for like every single question. Um, that was a little bit overboard for me, but to each their own, uh, do what works best for you. And like, I'm showing you this spreadsheet, but like if this spreadsheet doesn't work for you, like don't do it, do what works best for you. And then uh, I am going to turn it over to Fernando. All right, awesome, thanks Matthew. Um, do you want me to screen share it so I can like control it myself? Oh yeah, if you wanna if you want to do that, yeah, you can stop sharing. Right, cool. Um so we're right here. All right, cool. Screen share. All right. Um what is okay, here we're saying present. Oh, right. It's going kind of slow. Zoom has been acting like really slow on me today lately. <laughs> All right, awesome. Uh, so hi, everyone. Uh, my name's Fernando. So just a little bit more about me. Uh, my preferred pronouns are he, him, his. Uh, I am Peruvian American. So my parents actually came from Lima, Peru. I'm also a first generation college graduate and also a transfer student. I went to a small community college known as College of the Canyons. If you've ever been to like um, Six Flags area, it's like by Six Flags. I then transferred out to UCLA where I got my BS in biology in 2019. And I'm currently getting my master's degree in biology in UCLA. So I'll be graduating this year in June. Yeah, Gloria Peru, right? <laughs> um, my MCAT score, I took it in September of 2020, so I took it during the pandemic. Um, I got a 510, and those were my scores on each section. I'll be applying this cycle, so the cycle opens in May 3rd, and my goals are to be a physician, hopefully in family medicine, and pursue a, a DO versus MD. Um, I also aspire to provide equal, uh, equitable access uh, to medicine in the LGBTQI plus community. Uh, I've done a, a lot of volunteering with the community and it's something I'm really looking forward to do once I become a physician as well. So just a little bit more about me when it came to studying. So this is my, I took a screenshot of what I had for my actual study schedule. So for the most part, I studied starting, uh, studying in spring and continued throughout uh, summer. I was conducting research and taking some classes as well, so I sort of had to be realistic with the actual time I had. In spring, I was studying almost every day, um, trying to make as much uh, progress as I could, and then during the summer is when I just focused on mainly just studying for the MCAT. My basic outline for the most part, I actually studied uh, one book uh, and finished one book and moved on to the next book. This is just because I was taking my master's degree, so a lot of like the basic stuff that like from chemistry, physics, etc. I didn't remember much of it. So I just went on from one book to the next. So I read one chapter a day. Um, I did three cars passages a day, tried to do three cars. It was the one I struggled with the most in the internet. And I also did practice problems just to reinforce the material. So I personally think it's not enough just to go over the content. You have to at least do some type of practice problem to reinforce that material. And something I found super useful was trying to make time wherever time was available. 
Um, so maybe this might be like TMI, but I invested in like these markers that kids use in the shower. Um, so when I was showering, I would like scribble on the walls and like try to actively recall all of the amino acids I had to remember. I would try to actively recall any of the physics formulas or any of like the chemistry formulas I had to have memorized. Um, I made a poster of the amino acids that I still have over my bed actually. Um, and I would sleep. Uh, before I would sleep, I would look at it, go over it. And when I woke up, it was right there in my face and just go over it again and again. Um, so trying to do things like that, I found really useful. Uh, at one point I had a complete wall in my room that was just like sticky notes of things that I kept forgetting and I knew I had to have like memorized. Um, so I had a, my whole door was just covered in sticky notes and I would try to go over it. And the reason I put it on my door was because I had to open my door each time I left my room, et cetera. So trying to make time wherever time is possible is one of my biggest advices uh, for all of y'all. And so these were some of the materials that I used. So when it came to like books and memorization and those stuff, I used Kaplan Review. I really liked Kaplan uh, just because their material was pretty like straightforward. And they also had like these really cool mnemonics that they would always give you to like uh, have the information memorized. I also really liked Anki. So as Matthew was mentioning, it's based on the idea of uh, constant repetition and the idea of like the forgetting curve, right? So the idea is that once you learn material, you'll probably forget it the next day. Uh, and so Anki helps you not um, forget so easily and help you um, minimize your forgetting curve and retain information. I also made cheat sheets on stuff. So I don't know if all of the books do this, but they provide you with like a, it's like a booklet, a small booklet with like all the formulas and stuff you should have memorized. I personally didn't like it just because there wasn't enough space to like write extra information if I wanted to. So like, for example, I would make like my own like physics sheets. So I'm kind of like showing it here. I would make my own physics sheets with everything I felt that I had to uh, like learn, things that I couldn't like memorize exactly. So I made like my own cheat sheets for that. I see a small question. So, never mind. Did I, yeah, so for Anki, I don't have Apple. So I actually just ended up paying for it. It's something I found like really useful. I tried to do it almost every day and just be consistent with it. And I found it most helpful, especially for psych -soch. So unlike Matthew, I've, I really wasn't crazy about psych -soch. It's super interesting material, but um, I felt for me personally, psych -soch was just memorizing a whole bunch of different theories or like definitions to words. Um, and being able to apply it to like different scenarios. Um, so that's where Anki became like super useful for me, especially. Uh, for cars, I loved Jack Weston. Jack Weston was great. They give you an explanation also as to like why these, this answer is correct versus this answer is wrong. Um, Khan Academy, again, a great, great source to use for sure. Their videos go into depth onto the material that you definitely have to learn. Unfortunately, like Matthew was mentioning, Khan Academy is sort of like being shut down with the MCAT stuff, but you can still find their videos on uh, on YouTube. So it's still a great source to definitely look at. I used UWorld, so it was a bit pricey, but what I liked about UWorld is that there were a majority passage-based questions, and then the explanations they would give you as to why the answers were either correct or incorrect were like really good. And so I ended up, what I did was taking pictures or like screenshots of the, the explanations they would give me. And I made my own Word document on like um, things that I, I didn't know or things I had to review as well. When it came to practice problems, again, Khan Academy, UWorld, and the AAMC question packs are definitely amazing. Uh, I made sure to do all of the question packs just because that material was coming straight from the AAMC. So these questions are gonna be similar to ones you will see on the actual MCAT exam. For practice exams, I know Altius was given free exams. However, I don't know if they're still giving free exams now because of, uh, of COVID. They were giving it out during COVID, but I'm not sure if they're still giving it out now, but definitely a great resource to check out. Um, their exams were kind of hard compared to like the AAMC. Um, but I definitely check it out. 
Um, the AAMC exams as well, definitely make sure you get through the AAMC exams. Like I said, they're the ones making the exam. And so if they're giving you these practice exams, it'll be something similar to your actual exam when you take it. In addition, I also used Reddit a lot. So Reddit is like a forum for like different groups. You can make a forum for virtually anything. And so they had a lot of forums for like people taking the MCAT. They had um, for people who were going to apply, people getting ready to apply, et cetera. And so you can find a whole bunch of resources on Reddit. Um, you can find uh, Anki decks that are already made by people. You can find notes that people make and upload onto Reddit and are available to anyone. Um, so definitely something to check out. I also, um, on Instagram, they have a whole bunch of different, um, what's it called? Like different profiles, if you will, uh, that have a whole bunch of questions. So I applied to like, or I subscribed to almost like 10 or more Instagram, like MCAT related uh, profiles. And so anytime I went into MCAT, I was just flooded with a whole bunch of like practice questions. Um, and so that was a good way to also get some practice in um, and realize like what I was weak in, what was I strong in, et cetera. MCAT Bros is also like really good. So I found them on Instagram uh, and they're actually the ones that made those Khan Academy PDF files. Um, so if you check out MCAT Bros on Instagram, they provide you with a whole bunch of resources. The Psych and Soch, so what they did is that they took all the Khan Academy videos and they condensed all the information into like a 300 page PDF version. And so it's all of the Psych and Soch material from Khan Academy that would be like super, super useful. They do the exact same thing, if I'm not mistaken, for like the chemistry videos, the biology videos, et cetera. So I definitely check them out. Oops. And so how I used my resources, as I said, I used the Kaplan books. So I did, um, it took me almost like two weeks to get to an entire book. And I made sure to do a chapter uh, each day for the book. Uh, and then over time, I started making connections between the various topics. Um, so for example, like when you study about the mitochondria, it's not only about like metabolism, but it's also related to physics, right? You have like that separation of charge and that allows for generation of like ATP, et cetera. And so making connections between the different types of material that you're studying will definitely help you because the MCAT wants you to make connections between physics and biology and how it relates to chemistry, et cetera. You need to make those connections um, to get the overall big picture uh, stuff that they want you to understand. I also made Anki cards for the material that I could not grasp or like memorize. Um, a lot of them was again for formulas. Um, even though I had like my formula sheet, I made uh, Anki cards as well for all the formulas that I did. Did you have to memorize all the systems in biochemistry? Um, I ended up making like a little packet, if you will, of like all of the biochemistry stuff. Um, I would say like, you don't have to have it entirely memorized, but understanding big picture concepts of metabolism will be useful. There were occasions where I would get like a random question on like, what is produced in like the TCA cycle. And so maybe I would forget. So I would like have to like memorize the cycle at least or know some of it. I hope that helps answer your question, Amy. Um, again, like I said, I made formula cheat sheets um, and also quick sheets on material that I wanted to interconnect to one another. Um, so for example, when it came to like learning the digestive system, um, a lot of the content you learn about like the digestive system is mainly like biology stuff but you also wanna understand like the metabolism and like the enzymes involved. So I like digested the chapters from biology and biochemistry into like one sheet that told me what enzymes were involved, that told me where does digestion of carbohydrates or stuff like that happen in the digestive system um, and condense the material. Again, interconnecting subjects is like super important. Uh, Khan Academy, like I said, super, super well for understanding material you don't understand became super useful in physics and in psych and social for me because those were like things I struggled with the most. Uh, Anki, like I said, I used that every day religiously for psych and social because psych and social, um, just memorizing like the definitions and 
how you can apply those different words to different scenarios were like super important. Uh, cars, I did almost three passages every day. I will admit there was probably like a few days where I was like, I don't want to do this. Um, but you have to like do it just because cars is just reading passages and being able to understand them. Um, arguably, I don't know if you would agree with me, Matthew, but cars is probably going to be the easiest to study for in terms that you don't have to like learn content for it. All it really is is just practice and being able to digest the information they're giving to you. Um, and so I like how Matthew also mentioned like pairing something you don't like with something else that you do like will help you like get through it and understand the material as well. As for practice exams, um, uh, for practice exams and problems, like I said, Khan Academy, after doing content review, I would do some of their questions that they provided. U World is also great practice. Their explanations are really good. Like I mentioned, it's kind of pricey. So um, I think it was like three month access for like 200 bucks. So it was kind of pricey, but I was working and I was like, I'm gonna invest in this just because I've heard so much about it ended up liking it so something I would suggest, but it's a little bit pricey. Um, the AMC problem sets also are really, really good. Um, the problems are similar to what you'll see on the MCAT. And I ended up doing these actually at the end. So around like four weeks before my exam, I was just doing like practice problem after practice problem after practice problem, uh, and trying to just solidify all the material that I went over. For the practice exams, we had um, AAMC and Altius. Like I said, Altius was a little bit harder, especially in terms of like specifics, because they would ask you like really specific questions that I didn't see really on like the AAMC. Um, but it was good practice. Um, I would say check it out, but there are other options as well, like Matthew gave y'all. Uh, AAMC exams, make sure to do all of the AAMC exams. Like I said, this is material coming straight from AAMC, so it's gonna mimic the exam exactly the most. And so after I would take my exams, um, what was the one thing that I would do? I would literally just leave, I would relax, and I always went for ice cream. <laughs> so I would get ice cream after I took my exam, and then I would just review my exam the following day. And so my like, PDF on going over the exams was like this. And so I would write down the question in my own words to see like if I was understanding the question that they were gi giving me. Um, I would put in an image if it was like ever applicable and I would write down the answer and why I chose that answer. And I made sure to go through each of the actual responses and say why each response was wrong. Um, the reason why I also missed it and what topic it was related to. Um, if I reviewed it or not. So these two questions, like I did not review. Um, and I made sure to like uh, put where I got that question from. So this was a question from like Kaplan. The other question was also a question from Kaplan. Um, but doing this, I felt really helped me, especially for questions where I thought I was correct and my logic sounded correct to me. Um, but then as soon as I would review the question, I'd say, wait, like my logic was not right at all. And going through the questions as to like um, the responses as to why they were wrong, also like helped me um, understand other material um, and sort of solidifying that other material as well. Um, so material I forgot or realized I did, I went over, I did this and I also made, I have a big like notebook um, that essentially just um, is, if I got a question wrong and I noticed that I was getting that question like consistently wrong or similar questions that were on like the other exams, I wrote it down on this notebook and I would write down everything that was related to that question. So for example, I got, I kept getting questions wrong on like attitudes and behaviors in psych and social. So I wrote down anything and everything that was related to like attitudes and behaviors uh, on this notebook. Um, and I would study this notebook like religiously. Um, so that was super helpful for me as well. Um, and so, it, I, there were moments as well where I would feel like really discouraged. Um, I was like, oh, I don't know if I can do this. Like these questions are really hard and like you sort of get down on yourself. But the most important thing is like to not get discouraged and just to like keep practicing um, as well as like taking 
like breaks here and there, right? You don't want to burn yourself out, especially when studying for the MCAT. Um, if you feel you need to take a break, then take a small break um, and then come back to the material, but don't discourage yourself. Um, and also surround yourself in people that like understand what you're going through, um, you know, with other people that are also studying for the MCAT and get that support that, that you need. Um, my exams also fluctuated. So I was like at 502, 507, 508. There was a point where I started to plateau. Um, and that's when I really started to go like over the questions and going over like why I would get these responses wrong. Um, most of the time it wasn't like content related. Um, sometimes it's just you like misunderstood what the question was even asking to begin with. So understanding why you chose that answer um, is something that's really, really important. Um, and yeah, that was it for how I like studied for the MCAT and the, the resources I used. Um, so I'll give it off to you, Vanessa. Thank you both. Thank you so much for your brilliant review of how you studied and sharing all your knowledge and information. Uh, I'm going to open up the floor for any questions that anyone may have. Uh, it can be related to the MCAT, how you prepared for MCAT, how uh, either Fernando or Matthew really started to tackle the whole pre-med process. Because again, a lot of us come from non-traditional backgrounds. So uh, both Matthew and um, Fernando transferred to UCLA. Uh, from different sort of backgrounds, but they also know the transfer experience. So if you have any questions regarding that as well, feel free to share. Okay, I'm also going to go ahead and share my screen again. I also on my PowerPoint have some um, resources, so um, I'll I'll uh, send it to Vanessa, and she'll be able to get you in touch with those resources. Yes, as well. absolutely. So just to reiterate, uh, I will be sharing the presentation and the contact information for our lovely speakers, and we'll also be sharing a uh well this event has been recorded so we'll be posting it to the memento youtube channel and uh yeah any questions or other comments that anyone might have i see a lot of thank yous <laughs> it was a good question by rebecca actually so she okay. said any on studying posture or like oh. back like cramps right um i don't know i when I was taking like my practice exams, I didn't really like have like back aches or neck cramps. And I think just because I was like so tense and nervous, like taking the actual exam that I didn't focus on like, like the pain or anything if I did feel any pain. Right. Um, how about you, Matthew? <laughs> yeah, I don't have any tips on on posture, but I, I think just in general, like make sure you're you're also practicing self care, like physically like going to the gym walking wh whatever um just in all aspects of your life so like physically mentally emotionally whether that's like putting boundaries even sometimes if you need it like going to therapy if you have test anxiety um but yeah I think that that's important and just make sure you're also getting a little bit active because seven hours like it I took 12 practice exams and like it takes seven hours, like that's 84 hours just like sitting in a chair. Yeah, um, very true. Do you guys have any recommendations for how long someone who, who works full time should study? I studied full, I studied full time, so I'm not sure I'm best equipped, but I, I, I don't think there's necessarily like a time. I think it should be more like goal oriented, like hitting a certain score, but um, I don't know, Fernando, do you have any? Yeah, I would say for that is just like trying to find as like time wherever possible. Um, so moments where you like maybe go on Instagram or you're like um, not doing much or you're on a break um, as you're like working full time is like trying to put in and like wherever time is possible, like study 
even a little bit, um, going over things you know, like you have to go over, et cetera. Just trying to find a time, just like me, right? I, anytime I like even use the bathroom, I was like making sure I was studying on my phone using like amino acid apps to like study, like even drawing on the walls of my shower when I was like showering. Um, those are things that helped me to try to find time wherever possible. Okay. Blessing asks, do you think three months of prep is possible to get around 510? My last uh, MCAT score is 500. Yes. I, I, I only studied for three. Well, it, it also depends on like if you're studying full-time, part-time. Um, but like I only studied for like three months and I was able to get like above that. My, my first test was like a 498 and then I went to a 517. So I do think it's possible, it, but it also depends on like how, how much time you have and not just like, I guess, those three months. But um, again, like focusing on like the things that you're bad at, I think is really important. I think sometimes we can get really anxious about like tackling the things that we're bad at because you, you just kind of want to focus on the good things. But I think focusing on the bad things is, is where you'll, you'll get the most improvement in your score. Yeah. I agree too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I mean, I'm not an MCAT veteran, uh, but I do agree that, you know, just really understanding what your diagnostic test means and what that says about where your baseline is uh, can really determine how you're going to tackle whatever finite amount of time you might have. If you work full time, especially, um, you can then budget what you need, what salient information you really need to capitalize on and what you really need to kind of build the skill set for because I mean it's all information it's it's a lot of memorization and it's a lot of strategizing right so it's just kind of building that skill set just like any other muscle you got to build that skill set um, and I think that that'll tell you a little bit more how to budget your time and how to move forward past that but I think yeah definitely that diagnostic exam is key <laughs> yeah. um. I guess I'll go ahead and read the next question. So it says, for anyone planning to take a gap year, do you recommend any post back classes? Um, I'm in a gap year, but I didn't take post back classes due to the fact that I didn't feel like I really needed them. It really depends on where you're coming from. So if you feel you want to take a post back class to kind of maybe you're a career changer or you need to enrich your scientific knowledge, uh, I think that's definitely like a very personal decision, but if you feel that that'll make you more competitive towards uh, becoming a potential medical school or medical student, um, that's also something to consider. Uh, we do have a good number of videos on the Nimitor YouTube channel, uh, and there is a couple of webinars dedicated to that that are very specific towards like post back years. Um, but yes, that's definitely something that if you feel that you really want to take it for the purpose of either improving your GPA or getting that scientific knowledge or maybe even versing you, like for example, if you haven't taken, I don't know, genetics, and then you feel like you really want to know that knowledge before going into medical school or before taking your MCAT, uh, that's something that is definitely something to consider. <laughs> Yeah, and one one thing to just like consider is like what what are your needs? Like, do you just need like a higher GPA and you can do an informal post back? Which informal post back just means doing um, like science classes at like either community college or like a four or, or or like some sort of extension school or four year university. So like UCLA extension or maybe your local Cal State. Um, or do you need like a formalized thing? So a formalized post back usually has MCAT prep, advising, and uh, other like perks. But doing a formalized program is a lot more expensive. Um, and then if you're a career changer, there's sometimes post back specifically um, meant for career changers. Another thing is that there's also these special master's programs that sometimes uh, have an affiliation with like a medical school, and then you can get um, really I, I think there's a lot of schools that, that as long as you do academically well in the post back, you like automatically get an interview for that medical school. That's, I, I don't recommend like going into undergraduate, like thinking, oh, I want to do a post back because post backs are very, very expensive and there's no little to no financial aid for post backs. So yes. that's just something oh, to consider. Yeah. Definitely. Thank you, Matthew. Also, uh, a little shameless plug. 
just to reiterate what Joanna said in the con or in the chat box, there's going to be a Together We Mentor when to apply to medical school during your gap years event tomorrow. If that interests any of our participants today, um, you can go ahead to the MEMENTO website and check it out and register. Registration is typically open about two hours prior to the event, just so you can have the Zoom meeting invite in a timely manner. So if that's something that interests anybody, feel free to go over there. We have lots of events coming up. Uh, the next question was, did you guys learn any tricks that you picked up like while reading passages or uh, you know, going through passage-based questions? Yeah, for me, um, I realized uh, a lot of the time they give you like the response or like the answer in the passage. But if you don't read the passage like carefully, then you just like skim over it and you could have gotten it straight from the passage. So that was something that I had to learn, like making sure I read things carefully or especially when they ever gave you like charts of data. Um, making sure you're looking at the like correct actual like data piece you should be looking at. Um, those are things that sometimes I just gloss over completely and then I would go over in like my exams and I was like, wait, I didn't look at the correct thing. So that's, that's one trick for sure to definitely make sure you're reading the passages carefully. <laughs> um, one trick that I learned for specifically for research based passages. So anything with like graphs and all that stuff. Um, I would break down the, and this was one of the videos that I saw, so I could, I could also link the video um, to give them credit, but basically what, what they, the video said was to write independent variable, dependent variable, and results, and figure out what each of those components like are in that passage. I think that really helped me because um, I think usually in the passage they tell you what the independent variable and the dependent variable is, but usually when you look at a graph, it looks completely different like it'll be like some sort of like enzyme amount instead of like maybe they're 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 looking at metabolism but it'll be some type of an enzyme amount in the graph so it could be very confusing but because i ha i would write down the IV and db it made it a lot simpler and a lot clearer Thank you, thank you. The next question would be like, what did a typical day of studying look like for both of you? So for me, um, during content review, I was actually like a RA for a summer program and my co-RA was also studying for the MCAT. Um, and I also had a job, like a part-time job. Um, so I would go to the part-time job, then I would get back um, to campus. The, the, it was just like a summer job, so it was like three weeks. Um, and then once I would get back on campus, I would go get my books from the dorm and then go to the library and then study until like, which I would get like around one, and then I would study for um, until like five, just at the library um, doing the books. And then um, after the summer program ended, I would just do like basically a whole day, like basically like nine to five, um, and then once I got into practice problems, I would do basically the same thing, except I would just do it until I was done with my four to five passages of each section. And, and I would go to the, the local libraries when, after the summer program finished, I went to just like my local libraries or like coffee shops if it was like a Sunday. For me, I didn't get to study at coffee shops or anything. So that was kind of, kind of depressing because everything was happening with COVID. Um, but my typical day was like, well, waking up at whatever time I woke up, um, making sure I had some coffee. So I would usually just go to Starbucks, get like coffee, come back home. And it was just me like staying in my room, going over the chapter I had to go through. It would depend how much time I would go through it. Um, sometimes it would take like three hours, maybe four, just because I, sometimes I didn't understand the material, what they're telling me. Um, so I would go over the content. Um, something I liked to use a lot also was like the Pomodoro method. Um, so like studying for one hour, taking like a 15 minute break and then getting back into it. Um, just because just sitting down and like staring at what you have to like study for like just a continuous amount of time didn't work for me. Um, and then by the end of the day, I made sure to do at least my three passages uh, to cars and go over my Anki at night as well. Um, so that was like my typical day when studying. One thing I also want to say is I was 
because I was like, like I had my co RA who was studying, I think that really helped me like stay accountable in terms of like making sure like I studied and I wasn't like messing around or like on my phone or something. So if you do have the chance to like study with someone like physically in also another place, like that's always the best. Um, but I know with COVID, like that's not always possible. Thank you both. I'm gonna group a couple questions into one question just for the sake of time. Uh, but how were you able to get through one or multiple chapters a day? Was there a specific strategy that you followed? And is there an average amount of time that you should spend per question? Uh, so like in content review, um, like how many minutes on average per question? And does it depend bearing on the type of section that you're covering? Um, the one strategy that I liked to use was like the, the Pomodoro method, as I was mentioning. So I would study for like an hour, like going over the content and then taking like a 15 minute break and then coming back to study again. Um, I could not sit down and like study for like two or three hours, like on end without taking a break. My mind would start to doze off and I really wasn't like retaining any of the information at all. So that's something that really helps me a lot when uh, going over chapters and content review. I think for me, like I didn't stress too much about like knowing the itty bitty details. I tried to know like the big concepts and the, and the big ideas. Um, I think that's what helped me get through things faster. And then also the, the fact that I had just taken those courses, I think really helped me because I had like kind of a foundational knowledge to build off of rather than having to um, build off of like things that I for have forgotten. There was definitely things that I did forget and things that like I had to relearn. Um, but I think doing it like as close to when I finished the courses was the best um, move for me. Awesome, thank you guys. And then one final question. What would you recommend somebody who, for example, maybe they graduated last year and they can't really remember a lot of the scientific content from undergrad or are just starting out like tackling the MCAT? What would you recommend for them to kind of prioritize or start attacking the beast? I think like the, the, the biggest challenge to studying for the MCAT is just like starting. And, and I feel like that's the same thing for like the, the medical school applications is like doing doing your personal statement that the hardest part about like getting your personal statement done is like doing the first draft and then continuing the and editing it. Um, but uh, I think like just take a practice exam, figure out what what um, what places like you need like more help in and then also like gather what resources you're going to use at least for like your content review and then have a plan or strategy for what you're gonna use for your practice problems and all that other stuff. Yeah, I'd say also like the diagnostic exam is important, especially if you haven't like, you don't remember a lot of the material because then that'll tell you like um, what areas you're sort of weak on, what areas you're probably better at. And then from there you can start to build off on it. Um, I know some practice exams, and I know the AMC does this a lot more with their practice exams, but um, if you go over the exams, it'll actually break down each question into like a specific category that they want to test you in. Um, and so going over that and um, are you able to like understand the content that they want you to understand for the AAMC, um, that'll be something like really useful for you as well. Um, I think we forgot to also answer the other question about like the average time spent like uh, per question. <laughs> um, but like the average time I spent when practicing, um, I maybe like three, four minutes like doing a question. Um, I didn't stress out too much about like my time that I took per question when I was just doing like practice questions. Um, just because I I struggled a lot with like understanding a passage to begin with. And so I at first started like taking my time, like understanding the passages and like reading the questions. And then slowly I would start to like say like, okay, I'm gonna try to spend a little bit less time now. Um, and like sort of preparing yourself for the actual exam where you like won't have much time to like read everything carefully um, and like retain all the information that they're giving you in the question.
Thank you. And I think that concludes pretty much all the questions of the chat box. Um, just to kind of move forward. Thank you, everyone who participated. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you, Fernando. Thank you, Joanna. Thank you for all the participants that showed up today. And I guess just a final message is, okay, well, I'll be sending out the post-event survey. It's linked here, as well as the presentation. And then uh, we have recorded the session, so we will be posting that to the YouTube channel. But finally, Thank you everyone for really believing in yourself and taking that leap of faith really to pursue your dreams. You're all gonna be physicians. You're all gonna be amazing practitioners in the future. Don't give up. It's a beast, but we're here to help you. And regardless, you're gonna get that done. The fact that you showed up today on a Tuesday evening at 6 p.m. for an hour and a half, that says enough about your dedication to your own career and your own journey. So thank you for believing in yourself and don't give up, okay? So with that said, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and disband this meeting. Thank you, everyone, once again, and I hope you all have a very, very great night. Bye.